Hello, everyone, and welcome back for a brand new episode of Collider Connected. I am beyond thrilled right now because I am talking to the one and only Billy Porter for Pose, but we're going to be talking about so much more today because I don't know. I like I can't even get over how accomplished you are and how many things you've done and what what a big impact you're making. You are something else. I'm sure you hear oh, that all the time. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So I always like to start at the beginning because I love hearing about people's experience with early moments of inspiration. So mm -hmm. for you, what was the event, the performance, the movie, you name it, that made you say, that's the career I got to be in? Well, it's a combination of things. It was 1980. Um, desegregation was happening for the second time. It was the year that Reagan was, was elected president. Um, so I got to benefit from um, pre-Reagan public school system, our government takes care of its people kind of world. And so there were these after school programs. The book was literally like three, four inches thick, front and back on every page of different um, things that you could engage in after school programs that you can engage in. And so one of them was, the, the school was called Risenstein Middle School and it was called Risenstein Musical Theater. And I just saw the word musical and I sang in church and I thought, well, maybe, you know, I played the saxophone. I thought maybe I can, you know, I like music so maybe I can do something here. So I went to the first meeting. They told us what a musical was and they said that we would be having auditions the following week and that we could come in and sing anything. And um, every role in the show, everybody would get cast and everybody would have something to do on one of the four performances, like a step out moment on one of the four performances, i.e. every single role will be double cast. Because there were literally like at least 80 to 100 people in the show. So um, interestingly enough, that day, it was my birthday. And my grandmother and my great aunt came to pick me up at school and took me downtown Pittsburgh for a surprise. We had dinner. We walked into Heinz Hall Theater. The curtain rises. And it's the national touring company of the Wiz. And I'm like, this is a musical. This is what they're talking about. This is the musical. And I sat there mesmerized. At the end of the show, the character of Dorothy sings a song called Home that, um, MJ Rodriguez and I sang on season one of Pose. It's been in my repertoire ever since. I went to school the next day and I told my music teacher that I wanted to sing this song called Home from the Wiz for my audition, but I didn't know how to get the music. Two days later, she had gone to Volkwine's uh, music store, which is now the Andy Warhol Museum, and um, bought me the, the, sound, uh, the cast album on vinyl and the music, the sheet music. And I came back the next week and I learned and I learned home and I came back the next week and I sang home from the Wiz and the cast list went up and, and I'm a person that was not double cast. And it was the first time that I realized I might have something special with this singing thing because you know, because I couldn't play sports and I was bullied all the time. And for the first time, it was like, wait, I'm, they're accepting me. And not only are they accepting me, but I'm not double cast, which means that they don't want anybody else to do this for all four performances. That's a good thing. You know, so then you couple that with, after having done the show, after having, and the show was Babes in Arms uh, by Rogers and Hart, I played Gus Fielding. And you know, I grew up in the Pentecostal church, so the kind of music that I was singing in this musical wasn't something that I really related to. I just enjoyed it. So it, did, it didn't cross my mind that I could make a living doing it. For some reason, the Wiz, seeing the Wiz didn't I, didn't, I hadn't made the connection that people got paid to do that. And then that summer, this is a story that I've told many times, talked about it when I won my Tony Award. I was watching the Tony Awards. I didn't know the Tony Awards came on television as I was watching Dishes on the second Sunday of June 
in the year of our Lord, 1981. And I mean, first of all, it was a bunch of black people who were not slaves, who were not poor. They were very glamorous. We didn't see a whole lot of that. They all, all the ladies looked like Diana Ross or something. It was like, wow. And then all the men's were, men, men were in suits. And then it was electrifying. It was a, it was a, it was stage, but it was filmed and it was on my television. So my little 12 year old self, when Jennifer Holliday started singing and I'm telling you I'm not going, I was like, oh my God, that's how I sang. That's where I come from. Wait, she can make a living do it? Like, it just all sort of like came into full and clear specific focus. And that was the moment. That was the actual absolute moment. And I've never turned back since. I know it's a long story to get there. You can cut it however you might want, but. I really do appreciate that you remember it with such clarity too, because that, I'm that is a I'm my memoir changer. right now, so. Uh <laughs> So this I just like, finished writing that part of the story <laughs> like a week ago. So I, it's, it's fresh. I have many follow-up questions, but first, do you still play the saxophone because- it's not, I, I had to let it go. Right behind me right now is the baritone yeah, that I haven't picked up. That's a baritone up. sax. <laughs> oh my goodness, I played alto sax and I played tenor sax and I was in band all the way through middle school to high school. And then I just had to give something up. I was like, I, do I wanna be in band or do I wanna be on the stage? I wanna be on the stage. And to do both and keep my academics up, I was like, I need to focus on being on the stage because I don't actually wanna make a living as a musician. I wanna make it as a singer and as a performer, so. Very understandable. I went through the same thing, but now being stuck at home, I am considering buying a fresh batch of reeds for that thing and, and yes, give it a go yeah. again. I still have it. Might as well. Yes. So you have made a major mark on the theater industry, especially to start, but now you are obviously blowing up on screen. I'm curious though, is there anything you could do to keep the audience connectivity element intact when you're on set and that product is not making its way to an audience for an extended period of time? Something to keep that that connectivity between viewer, a live audience and you alive while you're performing on set? It's different. Mm -hmm. It's different doing film and television than it is doing live theater and concerts. It's different. There's no way to make it the same. They're not the same. And so for me, it's been about building the trust inside of my own art to trust myself enough to know that my work on film and television, that's not getting a response in real time, validating me in that way is enough. That took, you know, that takes a minute for a theater per, you know, it's interesting. There's a story that I, uh, that I have of the first shooting the first episode and Ryan Murphy shot the first two episodes. And I was in, I had gone back to kinky boots for 15 weeks at the time. So I was doing double duty and we were working on the first ball. And one of the things that I have had to come back in my career for a very long time is you know, that sort of double-edged sword of flamboyance. Flamboyantly dot, dot, dot. If there, if, if flamboyantly dot, dot, dot as an adjective and description wasn't in the description of a character, nobody would even call me for it. I wouldn't even be seen. And then I'd get to these flamboyantly dot, dot, dot auditions and then be told that I was too flamboyant. It got to the point where I wanted to literally kill people. It was like, I, I actually can't do this anymore. Like, I'm done. I am done. Right before Pose happened, I was like, yeah, I have so many other things I can do and so many other things I love to do, I cannot continue to put myself in this position and continue to be dismissed. 
Like I'm like I have not paid my dues. Like I have not been here. Like I'm not talented. I can't do that anymore. And it was interesting because Ryan. So when I booked the gig, I started shooting it, and the unconscious restriction of you're too big, you're too flamboyant, you're too much, pull it back. We can't have that. Whatever it is, I started doing my television version of what I thought was acceptable for Pray Tell. The category is blah, 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 blah. And I started doing it for television. I'm like, well, I'm on television, so I'm going to make it smaller. It's going to be more intimate. You know, that's what they want. That's what the TV people want. So I'm not going to ruin this job. I want to keep this job and I'm not going to be too much. Ryan Murphy, cut. He comes in into the room, comes up on set, and he's like, I need all of you. Don't worry about being too big. Don't worry about being too much. I'll take care of that do all of it, all of it. I'm like, you're sure? Cause once you unleash the Kraken, she ain't going back. <laughs> He's like, please unleash the Kraken and let's get moving. And that's his, and that's the, the rest is history. What is it about Ryan Murphy that not only leads to an exceptional ensemble, but also makes an ensemble kind of feel like a family. This might just be my limited perspective as someone who follows you all on social media, but it just seems like no matter what show we're talking about here, there's a very specific vibe on those sets where you guys are way more to each other than coworkers, colleagues, co-performers. So what is it about his leadership on set that makes a difference? Um, I just feel like he has been a a mouthpiece for the underserved, the underprivileged, the outcasts, whether it's being female, whether it's being, having a disability or being considered too gay or trans or whatever. He's always had this need to make sure that people are spoken for. And I think, at least in my own experience with him and Pose, it just feels good to be embraced as the misfit inside of a world filled with misfits. You know, it's like the arts is all misfits, but we've managed a hierarchy that then separates some from the others. Speaking of that hierarchy, and this might be, pray tell, just bleeding off the screen too much for me, but I get the impression that you are probably a leader and a father figure on that set as well. So yeah. as, as someone who is, I don't know, top of the call sheet, leader, what is important for you to do in order to set the right tone on set so everybody feels comfortable doing what they need to do in their roles as well? You know, I just lead by example. This is a very, very young cast. And a lot of them, it's like their first thing. You know, MJ has been in the business in theater for a while. I, I, I worked with her um, in 2010 when she, before she transitioned and she played Angel in the uh, off-Broadway revival of Rent that I was associate, an associate director on. So um, I know her from that. Um, but... It's my first television show. It's my first lead on a TV show. It's our first, many of us, our first in general. So, you know, me coming from having been in the business and especially being in theater, I know how to show up. I know what's required. And that has been a really great thing, I think, you know, to be able to be that guy. Um, and just, 
you know, not didactic, not in any other way, but like, this is how you show up. You're on time, you know your lines. It doesn't feel like this is your first lead role in a show to me at all. It's my first. It's, that, it's just crazy to me. Uh, <laughs> so one question that I love asking, and especially for you making the transition from theater to uh, television and film now, um, what is one seemingly silly question that you wish you had the nerve to ask about how a film set works? early on is there anything where you stepped well, on that i don't think that there are any silly questions <laughs> that, that's a great approach there was a question that i didn't know i needed to ask okay which was how to read the fucking call sheet <laughs> yeah so could be a puzzle <laughs> there are so many numbers there are so many lines like my but like i see all those graphs i'm like first of all y'all have to y'all have to use a uh a yellow, you know, a, what do you call those things? Like a highlighter? A highlighter. You gotta yeah. highlight my shit, because I can't see it. Hey, it's too small. I'm a 50-year-old with a trifocal. You know, like, I can't see this, first of all. Secondly, <laughs> secondly, they do this thing where they put on the bottom of the page not the next day schedule, but the following day after that. So if you're new to this, you've worked 14 hours, you're bleary eyed, they hand you one of these things and you see scene blah, 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 blah. It's right there. You're like, okay, that, 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 that. Came to set the next day wrong, late, because read the wrong call time. I'm never late. <laughs> you know, uh, didn't know my lines because I had learned the wrong scenes. I was like, okay, somebody literally has to sit down and talk me through how to read this. Why on earth would you put the day after tomorrow on a schedule? Anyway, who cares? <laughs> who cares? That was the, that was the, that was a big thing for me. <laughs> Season one, that was a big thing. I can understand that, but you're making the big leap from not being able to read a call sheet to directing an episode in season three. But just to backtrack, I want to know what you learned about some of the directors you've worked with on season one and season two. What are some of the biggest takeaways there? Because the challenge, I think at least, the great challenge with something like Pose is each director needs to be able to capture the style of a ball, but also the style outside, just a, a conversational drama. So yeah. what are you going to do to approach both of those angles? Well, I have lived it. You know, the greatest part about being 50 years old and having been in the business for over 35 years is that I know how to tell a story. I know what it is. I am the ball, you know, like I've been in the ball culture. I'm a musical theater person. So I see things visually and musically. I see, I, I just see it like that. I know, I know what that is. So I'm excited to, um, and I've been a director for 20 years in the theater. So I'm excited to sort of cross that now over to, um, I'm, I'm just excited to see what that can be. I'm so excited to see what you deliver. Actually, I am also curious, because I know you guys had to shut down. Is it like a mid-season thing? Is there any concern about having to step out of shooting season three and then jumping back in at a much later date? No, it is what it is. Yeah. I mean, that's what it is. There's no, yeah. it's like, Call us when we come back. We were eight days into episode one. We have a whole season to do. Oh, God. All right. We have well, a whole season to do. Got no no doubt in my mind that you guys are all going to rise to the occasion. Yeah, and, and we'll be fine. All over again. Yeah. Wants to get back to work and we'll be fine. Child. I, I don't blame you. And I, I know as a fan, I want you guys to get back to work as as quickly as possible when it is safe for everybody. Yeah. Just to go back to the beginning, though, I was reading that you were up originally for a different role in Pose. And now that I've seen it, I can't imagine you as anybody but Pray Tell. So who yeah. was that character? It was the dance teacher. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. That's Charlene, Charlene Woodard now. 
Um, you know, I, when they said it was about the ball culture and then I got the script to be a dance teacher, I knew immediately that that was not the role. I learned, I prepared the audition. I went into Alexa Fogel, I did the audition. And then I asked for a come to Jesus conversation. And, you know, luckily at this point, I was old enough and I was coming in with my Tony and my drama desk and my Grammy and my reputation. So I could talk in this way without being received as overstepping my bounds or, you know, being conceited or whatever, which has happened in the past to me before. Um, you know, but I just said, listen, I have lived this life. I'm almost 50. Like, I've, I've lived through this era. Um, I'm a black gay man. Like, it would be a waste of time to be doing a show about my culture and the thing that I lived through and have me on the outside of it. It was a waste of y'all's time and mine. Like, I, what, what about one of the mothers of the houses of? Paris is Burning is one of my, is one of my favorites. And that's when I learned that Ryan, Ryan's brilliant idea about having all the mothers be transgender women of color. Um, and I said, that's amazing. That's an amazing idea. But, or, and, aren't you going to need an adult male energy over there? Somebody. Just ask him. And they came back three weeks later and said, yeah, Ryan, Ryan agrees with you. And he thinks, you know, if he, he wants to see you be an MC. Like, if you can be an MC, if you can be an MC, he's going to develop something and write something for you. And that's how it happens. I can't imagine the show any other way. <laughs> this ensemble, hands down, one of my favorites. There are a lot of exceptional performances in it, but I do wonder who is one person in this ensemble that when you first read their role on the page, it became so much more than you ever could have imagined, that they brought something out of it that you never expected? Um, I would have to say MJ. You know, because MJ is the heart she's the matriarch and the whole point is these are chosen families they shouldn't have to carry the weight and the burden of an entire culture that's what i think is just so brilliant about blanca and one of the things that i don't think the industry quite understands you know because we live in a, in a world that is myopic. Very often we live in a space where the playing field is not level. But we're all judged as if it is. What people don't get about Pose in general, and this is for everybody, is that every one of those young kids on that show are on television, and myself included, are being on television, carrying a show as regulars for the first time. There's not training schools. They're not coming from Juilliard. They're not coming from Yale. They're not coming from, you know, New York University grad school or Carnegie Mellon like myself. They're coming from their communities. They're walking off the streets and delivering the performances that they are delivering. Sorry, but none of y'all can touch that. None of y'all can touch the fact that MJ Rodriguez is carrying this show on her back like Jesus on the road to Damascus with that cross. You know, it's like, mm, she didn't have no training like that. She didn't come from none of that. She had a dream and she showed up and she's delivering a performance like that. People don't really, it's like, they're not really getting that part of it. <laughs> they're not getting that part of it. 
It's like, no, she's delivering on it. Like, I watch her and I just, it blows my mind what she's doing on this show. She's carrying this show. Just like all them other white ladies carry all those other dramas. She's carrying it just like that. Without the luxury of having any experience doing it. That's extremely well said. Yeah. That, and, and, you know, and I'm trying to say it without being pissed off. No, I but, understand that. You know, it's like, no, you, it's like, yeah. I mean, you know, and I'm the glossy one. You know, I'm the glossy one. I'm older. More people know who I am. I'm the obvious one. Yes, I get it. And I've worked hard and I deserve it. Blah, 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 blah. I couldn't do it without her. And this show would not exist without her. Could totally. She's the grounding energy. The two of us are the grounding energy together. But in terms of the mother of the house of, she's the one that grounds it. You know. She's so much of the heart and she just yeah. oozes warmth and inspiration. It's just every single time I walk away from an episode of Pose, usually I feel motivated and inspired because of how Blanca carries herself. And I think it's because of the purity of MJ's performance and what she brings what? to that role. You talk about realness all the time. And I feel like that's part of the reason why that performance transcends the screen and becomes so much more. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting because it challenges people to understand, to, it challenges people to see another type of human being on the planet. That's a real human being that none of y'all have ever met before. So you actually don't know how to adjudicate it. They don't know how to adjudicate the performance. <laughs> they don't know, because they don't know where it comes from. They don't know what the history is. They don't know anything about it. Let this woman to be in the position that she's in. None of y'all understand that journey. None of y'all, you know, and we're trying to show it on screen, you know, but like, that's the performance she's delivering. For me, she should be winning everything. Do you think there's anything anybody can do to kind of change that conversation? Because I can definitely understand the, the frustration here. It's like, I don't know, even even from like this angle to, to tell to tell more of her story, to, to put it out there in awards campaigns more like what what can we do to change that? I don't know. I have no idea. You know, I'm, I'm the kind of person where I learned early on that like with as much of as awards are good for this little gay boy, you know, it's different for me than it is for, for my white counterparts. They don't need them. I actually need them so that I can be taken seriously. I actually need them so people will pay attention to me. It gives me power in a space where I have been powerless for so long. Um, you know, we just have to stay focused on the work. We are making headway. The fact that Pose exists at all. You know, I'm so grateful to have lived long enough to see that day. Pose? There's no, there's no context for that, for, for me. It was never an option for me. That was not an option for me, you know, so. Well, from this perspective, at least, I will do whatever I can to sing the show's praises because I feel like the more we talk about it and the more we spread the love, the more chance yeah. there is that people are going to watch it. And yes. it's really phenomenal. And another way I think that you make a great impression that uh, really strikes me is on the red carpet. Because to be completely yeah. honest with you, mm -hmm. I am the type of person who skips the red carpet and goes directly to the ceremony. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I watch. But yeah. having watched you on the carpet over the years, it, it, it's become even more than fashion. It's, it's fashion with purpose and that makes yeah. a statement. So at what point in your journey did you realize that you could say just as much on the red carpet as you could on the stage or on screen? It took me a long time to get to where I'm going. 
to get to where I am. I have lived through generations of white people reinventing themselves and being called brilliant. Whether it's Madonna, whether it's Lady Gaga, whether it's David Bowie. I will also add Grace Jones. I will also add, um, you know, Patti LaBelle, you know, back in her, um, uh, not Bluebell days, but the, 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 the other group. You know, like, I was faced having been in the music industry and having an R&B album that came out in 1987 um, and wanting to express myself. And for me, it was always the masculinity conversation. I'm not masculine enough to even be, to even exist on the planet. And so I understood the power of the visual. I was a teenager when MTV came on the air. So I lived pre-visuals and I've seen all of the visuals happen now and how they enhance a person's career and enhance a person's message. And I wanted to be a part of that. I'm like, that's what I wanna be a part of. But when you're male, and you're black and you're gay and you're not gonna do it in a masculine way, you're silenced. I got my shot because I took myself, I got a second chance because I took myself out of the masculinity game, conversation, whatever. I decided I don't care anymore about that. I will never be masculine enough for the outside people to accept me. That's all good. When I was doing what other po folks wanted me to do, I was bankrupt and unemployed. I finally started being myself, and this is what you see. It took a long time, don't get me wrong. It took decades. But I would never have what ha is happening to me like this any other way. And to springboard the fashion into that, I am first generation civil rights movement. I was taught that the first impression is what you look like, the, i.e. what you're wearing. I wore a suit and tie to school, a, a jacket and a blazer to, to high school every day because my and Dorothy told me to dress for the job I want. Dress for the job you want, not the one you have. So, I want to be in something. <laughs> I want to be in some kind of job where that's elevated, where I can make some money. <laughs> so I'm going to wear a suit and tie to school every day and act like I'm in private school since I can't afford it. <laughs> you know, like it's like the aspiration. That's what the whole ball culture is about. I was doing it without even being in a ball. I was dressing like a businessman, realness, businessman, realness, going to high school, because that's what I knew. I wanted to be there. I didn't want to stay in, in poverty. You know, so speak life into yourself. Dream it so you can be it. That's what I was able to, I, I don't know, I was able to do it. Everybody doesn't, can't do it like that, but I was able to do it. Uh, you you did it, and you're still crushing it. And this is why, before I let you go, I got to ask about some upcoming things that you've got on the uh, on the plate right now, and yeah. in particular, Little Shop of Horrors, because yeah. when I heard about that and I heard about your casting in it, I I don't think that a casting match could have been any better than this. So oh, you're so sweet. <laughs> I, I totally mean, I mean, the amount of times I've watched Little Shop of, it was actually in band class. Whenever my teacher didn't feel like teaching, we would just sit and watch it on repeat. So it was I a big part of my life. When you approach a voice role like that, how do you find the balance between honoring Levi Stubbs, but also making the role your own? Well, I've known this, this was one of the musicals that 
is from my generation, from the 80s. So I've known it. The songs have been my audition songs for years. I mean, I was also in the out of town revival tryout before it went to Broadway back in 2002. And I got let go from that. So I've already played the voice of the plan. Um, and I just approached it from the standpoint of what it truly is. He's kind of, you know, it's kind of like, the Faustian story, it's kind of like the devil story, like sell your soul to me. And I'll give you everything you want. He's a villain. And I like, I don't get to play villains very often. So get ready. Cause she's gonna be everything, all of the things. I'm gonna use all the different ranges of the voice. Oh, I'm so excited. I'm also very, this we're going to get pretty soon, actually. You in Twilight Zone. Yes! So we did get a glimpse of you in that trailer. In the trailer, and yes. I'm also mildly obsessed with Ethan Embry, so I'm very excited that you're in that episode with him. Uh, are you able to tell us anything about your character? Um, I can't really tell you anything about it other than, um, you know, I play a fortune teller or, you know, one of those kinds of like, tarot card readers and stuff. All right, follow up to that, not about the plot. Did you learn anything about the tarot card reading process? And, oh, and are you a believer? No, I didn't read anything about the tarot card process. I, you know, I'm a spiritual person. I think to each his own spiritually. I think it's, I, I think there's a lot to it. The stars and, you know, the mathematics of it. And, you know, I, I, there, there are some, I am open. All right. I'm always open and curious about that stuff. I love hearing about yeah, it. I'm open. Um, finally for you now, you, you've obviously accomplished quite a bit, and I imagine that brings a lot of offers in your direction. So a twofold question for you. Is there, is there anything that makes you say, like, why am I not getting an offer for this type of role? Where is that opportunity? And then... On the flip side, is there anything that like you keep getting inundated with where you're like, no, no, that's, I don't want to do that. I'm, I'm completely inundated right now, praise the Lord, um, with lots of offers to do lots of things. I have, my biggest goal in my career was not to forsake my nature. I'm flamboyant. I'm fabulous. I can stop a show. Everybody loves to do that. My problem and my issue and my journey was about the dehumanization of that particular archetype. I no longer wanted to be what I call the Millennium Coon. The Millennium Coon Show, the magical fairy, sprinkling healing fairy dust over all the white people, but you know nothing about me. You know nothing about my humanity. I'm just there as a prop for everybody else's human stories. So my goal has been to make this archetype, me, a human being. Pose, kinky boots, Everything that's coming in for me now does that. I don't mind being the clown anymore because y'all know that I'm an actual serious human being and that's how I'm being received. You know, it's different. I always use, um, I very often use the genie uh, in Aladdin. Robin Williams as the genie in Aladdin was coming from an elevated place to a Disney voice and making it this brilliant thing because he's a respected actor. That role for me without being respected as an actor is just a clown show. It's different for us. We're received differently. How it's received is different. 
And I didn't want that anymore. And Pose has enabled me to be able to change that and flip that. And I got that in me for best lead actor in a drama, a drama. That's what I, that's all I ever wanted was for the world to know I'm a serious person. I'm a serious person, y'all. Yes, all different kinds of levels and all different kinds of things, but I'm a serious person with real feelings and a real life grounded as a human being. Let's see that part. Let's embrace that part too. It's an and, not a but, it's an and. I am so glad that you are getting the opportunities you want right now because even just, even just hearing about your story right now it's like just adding another layer to everything that you've given me on screen and to so many people out there so really thank you for for staying true to who you are and for keep plugging away at this and thank just you. having a bigger and bigger voice every day because we all need it big congratulations to you on everything and especially pose right now for anybody out there who has not seen pose don't you get it because at this point in time, both seasons are streaming on Netflix. Billy, again, thank you so much for your time today. Thank I you. hope you're staying safe over there. And we can't wait to see you back on screen in more pose. Thank you.